start over. Okay, I'll start over. <laughs> my bad again. No, Titus, it's not your bad. I'm gonna put a sticky note on my computer. So when I get on there, there we go. Um, so I did my paper on relating humanism to practical wisdom, but I also included a lot of Aristotle's virtues, obviously. It all ties together. Um, so basically my overall point was humanism and practicalism kind of go hand in hand in developing what I would consider a good-hearted, well-rounded citizen. Um, so then I went into, um, in each paragraph, I went into different examples. Um, one example was technology. Um, I did a lot of research with this, so I put a lot of different opinions, I feel like. But um, so a lot of research that I did was saying the negative and influential parts of using technology and how it shapes us. And so um, one of my main points were that humanists defend technology due to its increased power in gaining knowledge and the power over nature. So I think that if technology is used in the right way, um, it increases like it leads to human advancements and happiness, which is kind of like one of the end goals of humanism. Another thing I talked about was fear. And we've talked a lot about fear, I know. But um, I feel like fear is a very uh, natural feeling. But then humanists talk about how um, we people need to be optimistic. And that uh, optimism leads to peacefulness and happiness. But I know with all the knowledge that we have and all the experiences that it's not always the easiest because we know so much and there's so much to fear. But um, I did point out that like a lot of our fear comes from ex our own experiences or reading about experiences and that Aristotle's virtue says that virtue is maintained by our own experiences or our own learnings. And so um, that was interesting because that's why you develop your own fear. So then I compared self-control and greed, um, how Aristotle talked about temperance. So that's basically where I went with that. So it wasn't just greed, but also pleasure. So Aristotle says that self-control is a variety of practical wisdom. And he says, like, changing your mind is in the service of virtue, and it's not a vice. So I feel like if you apply, like, knowledge and your experiences, um, along with humanism, like, you're able to take responsibility for your actions and more, like, take control of your own. So then I went into, like, sociability and a lot of things. Um, and then one of my favorite quotes that I pointed out, I think it was in somewhere in Okay, here we go. This was more like in the human condition that Aristotle speaks of. And he basically says that it's understanding the patterns of life. So I feel like without even Googling, I kind of just thought about patterns of life. And I thought about um, the negative like paths that you can go down, but also there are different patterns that Aristotle talks about. And that's like universal patterns, patterns in human affairs and natural patterns. Um, and that kind of develops us as a person. And then that led me to a phrase which by Aristotle. And it says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And I feel like using his humanism and wisdom, you can guide you along the morally correct path and create good habits. Um, I also talked about middle class, but we've talked about that enough that y'all could probably have seen what the paragraph was about. So then I just kind of went on and on about that. And then um, I just said with Aristotle's virtues and applying them with practicalism and hum humanism, it is capable to become the person that you want to be, which is happy and like just becoming a better version of yourself. And um, another point that I made in today's society, we tend to stick to the status quo and seek further opportunities to grow, learn, and inspire others. It is okay to stand up for what is right and use your knowledge to portray your beliefs and doing the right thing. And then I kind of made up this saying, 
um, with practical wisdom to do what is right, humanism to do what makes you happy, and carrying out your humanistic virtues without bringing down the ones around you, everyone is capable to make the world a better place. That was kind of my end thing. So, yeah, I think it all kind of tied together. Basically, I made one point there, and it's kind of like using your your head and your heart. You know, everything has to kind of work together. Um, so that's basically what I wrote my paper about. Okay, everybody has to clap. All right. Uh, let's have some questions. Let's have two or three questions or comments. Nobody? Well, I mean, when you say fear comes from your own experiences, the trouble, the issue with fear is that it is really powerful and it affects political life. But if you work on a middle class, people actually have less to fear. And if you shrink the middle class, that's a major fear, right? Okay, and if you shrink the middle class, crime tends to go up and then people fear, right? And then they're, they're willing to spend money on jails and prisons and all that. And then they don't spend money on education and healthcare and creating a middle class. So fear, if you over, uh, ex, uh, excessive fear or fixating on fear without realizing a middle class is the way to prevent fear, right? Is going to just lead a shrinking middle class will increase things people are afraid of, but then you have more crime and you have more expenses and then you can't form your middle class. So you really have to look at your experiences of fear in the context of were there social institutions? Is this institutionalized vulnerability? Is it unnecessary vulnerability, right? People are afraid, but can they fix the thing that makes them afraid so that there's less to fear? Does everybody understand that? I mean, it's a, it's a delicate balance, right? For political leaders to keep the country safe, but also not to spend so much money on military and police that you don't have education and housing and healthcare. And then people get more desperate and then the crime goes up and then there's more fear. Okay, so, so that is a problem. The other thing is greed. Greed will shrink the middle class also, right? And then people become more afraid. So, um, that's another problem. So somebody else should have a comment or a question, however, something. Or if somebody's paper is sort of related to this and you wanna talk next. Hey guys, it's only Tuesday. You're not supposed to be dead yet. <laughs> yesterday was a good day. I guess what happened maybe is you did your homework over the weekend, but now it's the week again and uh, it's too hard. I don't know. Um, Michael, if you don't feel good, why don't you go next? You don't look too good either. So, <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> he said you don't look too good. He said, you know, in his chat. And so, you know, before you fall over, um, can um, you can you hear me? You oh, could good. turn it up a bit. You could either turn your mic up or turn your voice up a bit. Okay, I'll, I'll, yeah. Um, so I did my paper um, about like, so it wasn't really like one of the like topics, but 
um, I wanted to do it about um, <clears throat> like whether or not um, like I guess like aren't like how we are like like when we're born whether or not we're um, whether or not we're like naturally like good or bad kind of if that makes any sense of course uh, yes ma'am and I talked about um, like I first I talked about like uh, the like Christian um, values uh, and that kind of thing and I'm also losing my voice so uh, bear, <laughs> bear with me um, and then um, I talked about um, Confucius, like some some Confucianism, and um, I talked about. Um, but anyway, uh, so for the Christian values, I talked about like the idea that we're all um, like carrying the original like sin from Adam, you know, from you know, uh, yes, y yeah, yeah, I assume you're aware. Um, and so I talked about that and how. Um, how that has somewhat like tied into th this idea that we are all um, born not not but I don't want to say evil, um, but can like we want to do bad because it's bad. Yeah, um, and then um, I talked about how like. Um, when like in these like in Christian households and what and whatnot, when you're taught that um, you are like not sinful by nature, but kind of when you're taught like that, um, that can almost have like a, a, a an opposite effect where um, you in turn want to like do better um, because you're told like you're told that you're this way, and so in turn you kind of want to um, you want to prove them wrong, if that makes sense. I mean, how so like being told that can also be a good thing, even though it seems to, to me, it seems like a bad thing. I don't, I don't feel like we're all like personally, uh, not personally. I don't think that individually we're all sinful by nature. Um, but I do think that the people that like shape us, uh, I, I think that that is, you know, I think, I think like the society and everything that we experience is what shapes us to be um, evil. Um, and then I talked about um, um, the, I talked about uh, a little bit of Confucianism and the idea that we're born good um, rather than, uh, rather than bad, rather than being, you know, sinful and whatnot. Um, and I included a, a few um, um, quotes um, for that part. Um, and like I talked about how like um, like in that way um, like ch not children but what well, kind of like children are taught that like they are born good and so like they don't they almost don't like even think about being bad I mean they also obviously think about it but like instead of whereas with like kind of the more Christian view like oh you're not that I've no one's ever told me like you were born bad or whatever but with the more christian view it's like you're you are born with a sin and so it's like uh you know you're trying to um prove it wrong and then with like some of the more confucianism confucian Confu confucius values um it's more of a like this is who you are you just continue to be that person almost um and then um so that was two like main main points of it, and I, I like I said I compared them throughout. Um, and I don't know. I wouldn't say that that was a, that wasn't about everything, but that was that was a general gist of the paper. Did anybody else? Uh, anybody want to ask a question or make a comment? I'll comment because oh, you can go, Titus. Okay. Well. I pretty much agree with you because I personally believe that all babies from the time they're born, I feel like their mission is to kind of fit into society or see what how they can fit into society, which means wherever they're born into will play a big role, specifically their influences. So if someone is born or if a child is born in a society full of criminals, then 
he'll think it's natural to be a criminal. It's not that he's born bad, but it's just what he knows or what he was taught. So, and obviously the same goes for if he was born in a good society or among righteous people, he will believe that that's the way to be. So I don't think it's necessarily genetically you are good or you are bad, but just what you experience psychologically. Right. Although it is interesting, sorry, this has nothing to do with my paper, um, but like they are starting to like within science, they are starting to like identify like aggression, like genes, like like genes that that are like found within more aggressive people, which is kind of like, I think it's kind of crazy, but sorry, that just what you said kind of reminded me of that. Actually, the science, you know, it's not the detached observer. There's a whole lot of nuance, right? So yeah. some, even Aristotle would say that some kids are born naturally more aggressive than others. But I mean, any mother knows that. Right. I mean, when my oldest one, I was pregnant with her, she was just, Ugh. and my second one, my boy, I thought he was dead. Okay. And then the third one was in between and they they are absolutely that way they've been that way their whole life the oldest one i was just with all three of them recently and i mean the oldest one and the the second one is he married somebody <laughs> he just plays back and lets her do her thing and um then my youngest one is pretty much in between and they've always been that way so that would mean you have to channel the aggression. That would mean you have to treat them differently, right? In order to get them to love virtue. Some of them you'll have to, uh, you know, maybe discipline more than others, right? But you still have the same goal. Um, you want to make them so they enjoy being good. Um, so this is where Aristotle talks about you learn by imitation. Does that make sense? You imitate the people and custom, which is the broader, and then habit. It becomes habit, right? Second nature. So that's what you mean when you say for human beings, culture is a second nature, right? So there's some basic stuff you start with, but culture really does crazy things to it. Um, and that's where we know through science now that people are totally equal apart from race, right? And apart from gender in their natural capacity. So societies that thought people are naturally unequal based on race and gender are wrong. That was the wrong foundation, right? So then a society that socializes people and kids learn through imitation to be racist or sexist or classist, right? Money doesn't make you virtuous. That's a corrupt society. Does that make sense? Um, I think with the Augustine thing, what they, you know, the, the expression for it is in a guilt culture, you are habituated to have guilt, right? To feel guilty. You know, and so to me, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe your kids want to do what's wrong because it's wrong and you keep telling them, don't do that. I know you might do that. You know, they're just going to feel either a lot of guilt or they're just going to say, I don't like this guilt. I'm just going to do it. Right. So either they're feeling guilty and being inhibited by this theory that has no relation to reality, or they're rebelling against a theory, but it's a it's self fulfilling, but it never makes uh, kids grow with integrity. They can't integrate pleasure and and virtue because they're told that that's impossible, right? You always have to repress your desires if you're going to be virtuous. You couldn't possibly actually feel, want, you know, have complete pleasure in virtue. 
That's what you're told is impossible. So you can't have integrity. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you, the rest of you? And then for the, the word for Confucius, where you're judged based on how you relate to people, that's called a shame culture. So when you shame someone, you say uh, your, your family will be very disappointed in you, right? Or the neighbors, or it's your identity is caught up in your, how you relate. And so to be evil is to do something shameful, something that brings social shame to people. And again, societies can get that wrong, right? that a woman who speaks her mind is taught to be ashamed of herself, right? So um, that's kind of the building block. Um, did anybody else write about this topic? I oh, Caitlin, it. go ahead. Um, so kind of weird because I actually was like trying to write about the paper topic, whether like how you're going to raise your kids, good or bad. And then I looked back at my paper and compared it to the topic. And I was like, this is totally not what I was planning to write about, but it ended up being like the same as Michael's. So it's really weird. Um, so like first I talked about how um, I talked about like Christianity and then I talked about like nature versus nurture. And then I talked about like Confucius. Um, so first I used some quotes from the Bible, like how God said he created everything and it was good. And he kept saying after he created things that it was good. And then um, he talks about when he created um, the tree of life and how that brought in like temptation. And uh, so I think that really we're born good, but it's just the tempta temptations in our environment. And so when I talked about nature versus nurture, I talked about how like we model our parents' behaviors and um, that can be a big um, like characteristic in how we develop. Um, I think like we've talked about before, like we're not racist when we're born, we're not sexist, but these are behaviors that can be taught through environment. And um, yeah, let me see. So, and I also talked about how, like, we're not, we don't get to choose the family that we're born into. So whether it's like, depends on if we're like lower class or middle class or even upper class, that also depends on which environments we grow up in and what different things that we see, what opportunities we have. Um, and then when I got to Confucius, um, there were some of his analects that stuck out to me. Um, this one says... When nature exceeds training, you have the rustic. When training exceeds nature, you have the clerk. It is only when nature and training are proportionately blended that you have the higher type of man. And that one stuck out to me because I felt like it was saying like, when you have a good, when you're born good in like your nature and you have the right training in your environment, then that's when you are like the higher like morals and virtues and um, those things. And then the second one that stuck out to me said, in his duty to his parents, a son may gently remonstrate with them. If he sees that they are not inclined to yield, he should be increasingly respectful, but not desist. And though they deal hardly with him, he must not complain. And so my interpretation of that one was, um, even if our parents are not inclined to yield, meaning if they are not able to like give us the things we need in our environment and like a good moral environment, then um, where did it go? Um, we must still be respectful and not like desist from our good nature and not let the environment affect us, even though obviously sometimes that's not not realistic. Um, so basically, I said I think that we are born good, but temptations in our environments and temptations in society is what causes us to stray away from morals and goodness. Okay, any anyone else want to comment? I'll comment. Um, so whenever like the Christianity, um, it reminded me of a verse that it was like, basically, Jesus was saying like, instead of being like this, you should be like a newborn who is born pure. 
and so like me and my mom have talked a lot about this because I feel like my parents are just you know my parents are not racist whatsoever and so they like taught us not to be but then we'll have family friends that I feel like really are and so my mom always makes it a point to know that like you were born pure. You were born without knowledge of knowing right or wrong or what even racism was. And so I just thought that was interesting. Basically, I really like Caitlin's paper. All right. Um, keep that in mind when you're raising your kids, right? <laughs> um, anybody want to go next? Jason, good. Oh, uh, I was about to comment on her paper, but I guess I could go next after. Uh, so um, she brought, uh, I can't really remember the whole quote, but she was talking about like, um, like uh, the right training with like nature. It's kind of like that uh, nature and nurture thing. Like which one is it? Is it this one or that one or both? And it's, I think it's like a, a mix of the middle, like a compromise between the both. And it, and it reminds me of this, um, I don't know if this is true, uh, but um, there's a story. I think it's a uh, King Solomon, where he had two um, he had two babies, or just, uh, they were, and he put them out in the wild because he wanted to figure out um, which language was the first ancient language. Was it Latin or Greek? And then um, when they um, he let them like basically live out their lives by themselves, and then every now and then he'd check in. And then when he checked in, once they were like a little bit older and mature, he uh, f he found out that like it was neither Greek or Latin that they spoke, but it was only um, some that they came up with. Um, it was a certain sounds, and um, you know they had their own vernacular and everything. The two kids came up with it, and he was dumbfounded. And I think that um, just goes to show like it's it's all about your environment, how like it pretty much molds your life. You know, like everybody was saying, like no one is born that like I, I do think everybody's born uh, like may hannah said um no knowledge of anything obviously you're baiting your brain probably not even fully developed and so um when you grow up you pick things up along the way whether it's from your mom or your dad your friends other family and um that kind of thing is what molds you so like when she brought that up i just thought about that story about king solomon and the two kids so nobody's born speaking greek either Right, that too as well. So, and then I'll okay, I, and then I guess I'll go on my paper now. Um, so I did mine over um, the four paths of Hinduism, um, which was um, it was a path of, it was uh, the path of pleasure, the path path of success, the path of duty, and then the last one, um, like having a spiritual crisis, was the path of liberation. But I I mainly talked about. Um, the path of success and the path of liberation. I kind of tied in the path of pleasure into success because um, I think like as humans, as like just naturally, we're always looking for something to make us happy. And, um, and like when it comes to success, that could come in any form, whether it's like wealth, uh, power, uh, happiness, uh, maybe a mix of everything. Uh, we're always looking for something. And part of that also plays into pleasure. Um, you see all these big tech companies like Apple or Samsung, or Microsoft, they're always releasing something new almost every other year. Like you can't even like go release like the new iPhone 12. And, and I just literally saw an article the other day. They're about to release an iPhone 13. And we literally just got the iPhone 12 like about a year ago. So it's like they're, they, they constantly feed this to us. Like so we can to keep the audience, we grab at it at, like any second we get. Like we're always trying to find the next best thing. It's, it's never, oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna stick to this. It's always trying to find some to like satisfy a hunger for like pleasure, whether um, it's like from a phone, or a friend or somebody like, it's, it's hard to find longevity. So we're always looking for pleasure, temporary and some quick, fast, not too long. And then also, um, so, about, um, so on that outline about um, the Hinduism, um, uh, how like there is a path of desire and it broke off again into um, pleasures and success which was like the pleasure was like monetary kind of selfish kind of thing and I think the pleasures um, like I said uh, with the pleasures is like well oh, it's like temporary some quick fix for I want to say a junkie but like you know kind of like the analogy is like a quick fix you know we're always 
jumping at the slightest thing or something to, to give us that quick pleasure. And um, the path of liberation, which is like, uh, as we're talking about um, experience of spiritual crisis, I think when people get to that point, um, like that point of like, where it's not enough, where um, um, that's when they start to like look into themselves and, and decide like, is this really what I wanted? Like, you know, once they get to that point of where nothing can satisfy you, not, in, not enough money, not enough cars, not enough this, um, even, I mean, I guess you could say like happiness at that point couldn't satisfy you. I think that's when you really have to look inside yourself and you, like, you liberate yourself to truly look and see what it is that you want from life. Okay, that's the conversion, right? Turning around. Okay, good. Uh, anybody else want to comment on that? All right, did you quote from the text, like Houston Smith's book and things? Um, kind of from the outline, really. The, you should read, not, yeah. you should quote from the book. Yes, ma'am. Right? Okay. Uh, uh, just because, yeah, outlines aren't really quotable. Um, and also, you, you have to show me that you're reading the book. It's not that I don't think you aren't, but you have to show me that you are, right? Um, just in, in general, right? It's nothing personal, <clears throat> but <clears throat> yeah, the, the outlines can help direct you to what page, you know, approximately what place in the book that would be. Um, all right, who's next? Who wants to uh, present next? Titus, go ahead. Yeah, I'll go next because mine is going to be rather quick since it isn't completely done yet, but I do have enough to tell you about it. So the title of it is going to sound a little like deja vu because it is should Sac Socrates have left. Now, I know a brief, but give me a brief reminder of my previous opinion that I said he should have because of thinking down the line instead of right now that it would have been better for the future of his kids. But going into this paper, I'm really comparing it to Confucius and how he lived his life because he actually ended up leaving. So basically, as you know, they were similar in, the, in their personality and the way they talked. They both had problems with their authorities. And before I forget, when I'm asking if Socrates should have left. This is before he actually went to prison and was sentenced oh, to death. Okay, okay. So just to get that out the way, I'm basically saying should he have left when he was pro having problems with the with the government, just like Confucius actually, was. Actually, he was having problems with false rumors against him. Right. Yeah. No, so, I get it. I get it, Titus. Okay. So basically. My, my general thesis was that I am kind of having second thoughts of about saying that Socrates should have stayed because when going through Confucius's life story, he ended up leaving with his disciples coming with them. Now there was only two times mentioned that people might have came after him, but the history in that is inaccurate and that outside research is kind of what's taken me a little bit longer to write this paper. But eventually he ended up coming back and they, and it was at a time where the government was collapsing. So though he didn't get a official job as part of the government, they did assign him as a village elder in which leaders of that government came in actually started listening to and taking advice as well as he was able to continue his career at well, not a career but he was able to continue teaching so i was starting to think of that in the view of aristotle because if he would have left there's no certainty that people would have came after him and eventually we know that athens government collapsed so if he would have came back at around that time it was collapsing, I'm pretty sure somebody would have been listening to him out of desperation to save their government. So I feel like it's 
possible. Obviously, we cannot guarantee any of this, but I feel like it's possible that he may have been more successful in getting out his ideas and becoming more respected if he did leave early on and kind of, I don't want to say take a journey, but kind of take a break from Athens and then come back. But I know he has specific values against abandoning his society. So I understand why he didn't want to leave. And that's pretty much the basis of my paper. Like if y'all are interested, I can, I should have the paper done later tonight and I'll be able to give a full presentation tomorrow. Okay, so this is just a, you know, everybody who thinks their government is corrupt um, has to choose every day pretty much how they're going to speak out. Um, and partly if, if you're going to move to Canada or something, um, or are you going to stay in the US? Are you going to speak out? Are you going to um, put up and shut up, right? So those, those things are all issues every day. Um, Titus, just, just, I think the patterns you have are fine and they're more important, but just to FYI, actually, um, Aristotle went and taught Alexander and Alexander created this empire. Uh, Aristotle set up his school right in Athens. I've been there. It's really close to downtown. And he his standard for justice was natural and universal and so the authorities he did get in trouble but he ran away he said i'm not going to let athens commit two crimes against philosophy and he left <laughs> so i mean just it's interesting right because socrates decided to stay and get killed and Aristotle decided to leave. Uh, but the issues keep coming up again and again. So that's more important. You know, I don't know if you want to adjust your paper to that, just a historical data point. But unlike most professors, I would think, just because the data point is different than you thought doesn't mean your paper, there's anything wrong with your paper. Okay. 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 Um, anybody else want to comment to Titus? Okay. Um, all right. So who else hasn't presented? Trey, you want to present your turn? Yeah. <clears throat> so I did mine over like the Black Lives Matter and humanism and trying to like relate it to religion too. So I started off with saying like, uh, we all desire like wants and needs kind of like going with uh, Jason said, everybody has their own wants and needs and we desire our own goals and dreams, but we don't know really like how to get to them. So I feel like it's our part to like go and well, I talked about it later too. I'm gonna get to that part too, but I feel like we have to, um, access one another's like uh, uh well-being and stuff like that not like well-being but like being friends pretty much because um like we need to talk to people and communicate to get to where we want to be because i don't think you could really like do it by yourself like some people can do it by themselves but it's going to be a lot harder if you don't you know talk to people and and try to you know get people to help you out or is on the same page on the same goals and tracks as you and then um, I kind of like going along with like the action and stuff that's been happening in with Black Lives Matter. I feel like some of like the action and like the little dangers that could be happening are they're, they're made on like clueless actions out of like anger and then like following along with the Black Lives Matter. Like we're kind of unknown to the things we do or the things that we do that resolve around anger. So I feel like most people are like just kind of acting upon like not thinking really they kind of act first around like thinking first so um we just gotta fix that part of it and i just talked a lot about that and i do feel like we care about each other and and each other selves but we just don't know how to care for one another so and i feel like some of that could revolve around like being scared or like you know clueless on other people on what they're like thinking about or you know because you never know what somebody is and a lot of people are like 
un, un opening to like making new friends and stuff like that because they don't really know who that person is or what they're getting into. Um, and um, what else I talk about? I feel uh, like uh, somewhere uh, in the late days going on with like religion kind of, I feel like in the late days uh, somewhere in a, uh, they kind of like abandoned the religious ways and like following God. So kind of like um, with Adam and Eve, pretty much they're like, they, the disobeying of God kind of just started off in the beginning right there. Like, and I feel as if we're more self-centered. So we, 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 do care like about what we have going on, but like I feel like morally we're just mainly focused on like ourselves and and what we have going on in our life, and that's okay. Like it's totally fine, you know, going and doing things you want to do, be who you want to be. But then again, you got to think about like what others might say or what others might think. But then again, you don't really have to care what somebody thinks about you or says about you because that's your own thoughts and stuff. And um, uh, comparing that kind of like with Black Lives Matters, with the self concern, uh, self concerning, uh, I just think that we should love one another because I feel like uh, God wanted us. God started off saying that He wants us to love each other and and treat each other equally with the same respect, and we haven't really been doing that uh, in Black Lives Matter moment and stuff like that, pretty much. So I feel like if we do love one another and care for one another and treat each other with the same amount of respect, we'll get to our wants and desires that we want and our goals are relating to all that good stuff. And um, the last thing I uh, really kind of said was we have to just care about one another and, and think and care for other people's thoughts and concerns too, because we're not the only person like to just have the same thoughts and concerns or have different thoughts and concerns. We have to like respect each other with what they're going through and, and how they feel, but we can't really um, resolve that problem if we're resolving in anger and confusion in the way we act pretty much. And uh, I feel like our connections with others could help us seek our dreams and goals. Cause once again, like I said before, we, if we do talk to one another and do, you know, correlate with one, each, uh, one another, we could, you know, get to our goals and reach our goals. Okay, questions or comments? Yeah, I'd like to comment on that. Um, I think what Shrey brought, uh, brought up about like people being self-centered, I think that's a, it's a pretty good thing. Um, well, being self-centered yourself, obviously, um, not being like, a, what do you call it, conceited. But I think, um, like, you know, like when you want to do you, you want to do, you know, you want to do some, like you want to do your own thing. Sometimes you end up neglecting, like how he said, like other people's thoughts, but like, or in feelings, but is that really being selfish or is that just doing what's like best for you? I think that's like a kind of a big, um, I think especially now with like people are trying to be like, you know, trying to be yourself and all, but like some people see it as like being selfish when uh, if you like act a certain way, but like that's just like how some people are and maybe that's, that's what they want to do, but to others, like it seems like selfish. But to you, it seems like, you know, it's the right thing to do. It's something that I want to do. And um, another thing on my trays, uh, saw how like people, um, I, want, I, I don't think he said lashing out necessarily, but like do certain reactions to like the um, BLM. And like, uh, it's, it's like, it's kind of hard for like, um, I'm not in their shoes, so I wouldn't know. But like for years and years and years of like neglect and then you know, you you know, people lash out one time, and, and then all of a sudden they're the villain. And I feel like sometimes it's kind of necessary to fight fire with fire. Um, you know, sometimes I mean, I'm all for bringing like, you know everybody getting along, but sometimes you know, it's, to get the point through, you you know, you got to do something. So, go ahead, Mariana. Um, just going off what Jason said, that reminded me of like MLK, like the letter from Birmingham Joe. And how basically um, the reason for like acting out, like he clarified it really well. I'm not going to say word for it because I don't remember and I don't have it pulled up. But he was basically saying like nonviolent actions can only go on for so long. Once they're not seen or not heard, then you have to take it a step further. And a lot of people agree with that. A lot of people disagree with that. Um, I feel like that is a big argument in today's like how far is too far so i just thought that was interesting yeah 
Uh, I like to say something again. I think uh, kind of like how she said, like, how far is too far? Like, is it ever justified sometimes for uh, certain actions? Like, you know, sometimes it might go to the extreme, but then when you put it into context, you know, you question whether if it was ever justified in the first place or if it is justified. So, like I said, like, you know, like, people were lashing out due to, like, years and years of, like, how they were cheating and stuff and, and kind of, like, putting yourself in their shoes and trying to understand and so then you might, you know, then you could consider, okay, yeah, it was justified or, okay, maybe you just might have to push back a little, you know, sometimes you can't be on the defensive all the time, so. All right, I just feel like I'm not a violent person, so I'm like, I read about that stuff and it makes me just want to cry. I'm like, all these people keep dying and it's just, it's just heartbreaking to me. So in theory, right, Aristotle says anger is uh, sometimes appropriate, right? Too much, too little. It's not right never to be angry because then the person doesn't even know they did anything wrong, right? Or they don't know anyone disagrees with them or that it's problematic. So uh, you're not doing someone a favor if they do wrong and you don't point it out and get angry, right? Um, and, and so you can overreact or underreact. And it's more likely that you overreact, but it's justified, right? So Martin Luther King knows that people tend to defend the status quo. So when demonstrations get violent, the, it, things tend not to change and there tends to be this reaction and it tends to not work, right? But, um, and the poor tend to suffer no matter what. Any kind of instability will lead to more of a strong man and then the underserved will tend to suffer the most. But he does, he warns people, right? People are angry and I'm going to stay nonviolent, but other people are not. And um, you, you need to do something about it. He's just speaking truth to power, right? Um, uh, I do want, like, um, let's see, was it Titus or was it Trey? It was Trey. Okay. He said some people do make it themselves. And I, I just, nobody makes it themselves on their own, even close. Right, Trey? I mean, you do need to understand that. They'll present themselves that they did and they didn't, right? I mean, Donald Trump, great businessman. He got 240 million bucks from his daddy-o, okay? And if he had only put that money in the stock market, he would be like 10, 20 times richer than he is, right? That doesn't make him a good businessman, right? So you can't just look at the bottom line, like, how big his companies are, he did not do it by himself, even remotely. Um, and I, I mean, if you think we are creatures of culture, you think uh, Bill Gates wouldn't have Microsoft unless he had janitors cleaning, right? The, the floors and people cleaning the bathrooms. I mean, we all need each other. Does that make sense? I just think, we're, we don't think about stuff in a way that actually fits reality. <laughs> reality is we're so intertwined. Um, yeah, and that's what you were saying mostly, right, Trey? You said we need these friendship bonds. So that's what you were saying. Yeah. And I just think, yeah, I don't think there's anybody that comes anywhere near doing it themselves. They just want to sell you on that. <laughs> They're trying to sell themselves, right? Their brand. Um, but yeah, because we need each other, that's why we get angry, right? Because we need each other. And then, and, and that dependency leads to fear, fear that, you know, someone's going to hurt you or someone's not going to help you. And that leads to anger and that leads to more fear, right? So that's another spiral downward is, um, when people betray their trust or they, you know, relationships, any kind of relationships go bad, then you have this fear, anger, downward spiral. Um, 
Oh yeah, do you remember? I think maybe what Jason and Trey want to say is, it's fine for you to to focus on your education, focus on developing expertise, right? You can't, and then you have to not pay all, you know, spend all your time volunteering or spending giving money away, so that eventually you can help people better because you're in a position of expertise. And you can speak for what it is you're working on. You can publish, you can give lectures, whatever it is. So, so I think it's a mistake to think self, you know, selfish versus um, selfless. You, you just, there's times in your life, remember the student, the householder, retirement. In the student time, you do have to just <laughs> do your homework. That's what your teacher says, right? Uh, but I mean, get that expertise. And I mean, I remember sometimes I just got so frustrated because I didn't want to get that self-absorbed, right? It took me 17 years to get my degree. And I just thought <laughs> I wanted to give back, you know, I don't want to just constantly have to struggle with this. But uh, in the end, right, you can give back more if you've got that expertise. And another thing was, um, remember going back to education is, it's not just a personal achievement. Remember that article from the historian? We used to think of it as a social good. So when people wanted to pay taxes so everyone could go to college, they would want kids to, to do well in college because it's all a social good, not just a personal achievement. And then that affects what you do with that achievement. Does that make sense, Trey? Yes, so. Okay. And then, uh, uh, I got something else like going along with uh, Mary Hannah and Jason with the whole like lashing out. You can tell that they really care about what's going on and they don't really want to see the anger and stuff like that that's happening. But uh, that's just going back to like basically uh, me saying in my note, uh, hold on. I was just basically going about because I said I said I do feel that we care about each other and and care about what's going on. We just don't know really really know how to how to stop it or or how to you know deal with it pretty much. So I mean that's basically what I want to say. Like you can tell people people really care deep down inside, but we just don't know how to you know apply ourselves and access the the things we need to do to stop what's going on. I also think you need a lot more adult role models, right? That that model the kind of behavior, right? I mean, we've got so much polarization among adults, so they're not setting a good example. Does that make sense, Trey? I mean, maybe you personally have a lot of good examples, but I mean, in the news and there's so many places, there's so many adults are just acting like children, right? They get, get sent into time out you know, in first grade, if they behave that way. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, and that's hard on you because you literally have to say, I don't want that. And so you have to sort of invent in your head what you want. Whereas imitation is so much easier, right? Kids just do it all the time. Um, okay. Okay, Mary Hannah, I forgive you. <laughs> um, and then the one other thing was there's nature, nurture, and culture. And uh, the people who set it up as nature, nurture are the blank slate folks. The, and the ancients don't think there's a blank slate. They think we are, culture is a second nature. So like naturally, yes, some kids are born with more aggression, less aggression. But you can set up a whole society that rewards competition and aggression, and people will become more competitive and aggressive, right? And you can set up a whole society that rewards and respects cooperation and staying calm. And all of a sudden, people will cooperate and be calm. Does that make sense, Trey? That culture has a big effect on that whatever original starting point you had. Um, all right, so we have to move on. Lekesny? 
Mi hermano. Oh. Mi hermano. Fourth topic. Well, it's, it's not done. So I don't really have much. And the fourth topic was for us. Um, uh, what the United Nations know about uh, country size forms of murder, a part of the segregation of women. Um, it was mainly about uh, how the UN will not uh, destroy their religion. Uh, how I think it's going to keep like keep going on because it's their religion, those countries' religion. Um, I talked about their religion. On it and how it's not going to stop, but how I think it's not going to stop and relating it to and how, like, how our women oppose their, their uh, thoughts on equality. And back then, when they wanted to work and all that, and still now, um, but how they can't, I don't think they can really oppose it because it'll be. Religion, and I don't think nobody would, like want to go against their religion. Like, <laughs> it's yeah, um, it's okay. I think your computer is going in and out. I I really can't understand what you're saying. Um, it's it has to do with the UN and women and religion. Is that right? Uh the UN. It has to do with the UN and the acts towards the countries that exercise forms of part of oh, and okay. the same race of the women. Okay. Uh, so actually the article on Perda is way, we haven't read that yet. Are you scrolling down? You have to keep scrolling down on the sheet to get, I do have the dates. So you should check, scroll all the way down and then it has every date. Yeah. And they had the uh, paper three topics. I got it. I think we just haven't gotten there, even on the paper topics. We're still way farther down in the, in the semester. Um, anyway, why don't you check the classroom, the Google Classroom, and make sure it says, class for July 27th or class for July 25th. It'll be very specific. Um, if, if you read something that says Wednesday's class or something, that's not, that's not uh, where we're at. Um, anyway, so you can, you can talk to me tonight after midnight, or you can just, um, just try, we're, we're working on Hinduism now. So Purda is related to is uh, I'll come to your office. Okay, okay, thanks. This is the last night when I don't have office hours because I have a class tonight. Um, but if you want to email me a time during the day that you'd like to meet, that's fine. Um, okay, Akaya, I think you're the last one. Yes, ma'am, I am. Uh, so my my paper presentation might be a little short, but essentially I talked about uh, Confucianism and the five concepts. And so um, in each paragraph, I just went over like the main concept. And then I talked about how um, how Confucius used that to stabilize his civilization. And I also gave examples. I talked about social media and like the corruption of social media and I also talked about how like it can help us um I talked about oh I had um a quote that stuck out to me that was important in my paper um it said if I am walking with two other men each of them will serve as my teacher I will pick out the good points of the one and imitate them and the bad points of the other and correct them in myself so I feel like that was important because I like in order to be able to find yourself, I feel like learning from others helps you and then being able to pick out bad things in them and correct them in yourself. I feel like that makes you a stronger person and it also can help that other person. And then I talked about Jesus and Christianity. 
um, I essentially like compared how uh, Jesus wants us to like live by his word and do right unto, unto him and help others to see him and Confucius and how he wants us to be able to respect each other and treat each other equally. And um, I talked about why the our nations might not be able to like achieve these concepts because um, corruption and then also because people like their psychological state of mind, some people just can't control how they think or how they act. And I talked about my views and why I think um, these concepts have lasted so long and how they are, how they can hinder our um, country and also help our country, so. Good. Sorry, I was a little nervous, so I was. A little was, what? I was a little nervous, so I was kind of fumbling over my words. <laughs> oh, nobody, everybody loves you, Akia. You don't have to get nervous. Uh, okay, somebody ask her a question. We'll give her a applause. Okay, now she's not gonna be nervous. All right, so somebody, Ask a question or a comment. Um, I'd like to comment on her. Uh, she mentioned how like we probably won't ever like our like um, certain nations won't ever get along. Um, I think that's what she said. I couldn't right. Okay. Um, I think I think we can. I think it's like the people, the people itself. We do, but the people at the at the top. Um, I think they want to, in order to maintain, you know their uh, authority and their legitimacy or, you know, or their, their power, they they don't want to get along. Um, I think the people like down when it comes down to it at the base of it, the foundation, the people itself, we do. Um, I think everybody, I think everybody wants to get along. I don't think anybody, you know, wakes up and is like, ah, I don't want to get along with that person. I think everybody wants to. But um, again, like I said, I think it just, at the, at the top of the things, at the top of the pyramid, everybody who, who's in power, in order to maintain that, that they won't, they're, they're not willing to. And so they're willing to sacrifice, um, you know, um, certain things and even make probably the greater good for people in order to um, maintain their power. Yeah, you do have to be careful because politicians are different. Some politicians get votes from dividing people. And some politicians get votes from cooperation, right? So, I mean, you need to vote on what you want because it's self-fulfilling, right? I mean, if people, you get the politicians you deserve <laughs> that you voted for. And, you know, it obviously it's very complicated. So you might end up voting for a divisive person, but not because they're divisive, but for some other reason, right? But, um, you know, you have to decide how much of a priority that is also. Um, how much of it is divisive versus cooperative? How important is that as opposed to specific policies, right? So I, you really do need to keep Keep asking yourself, keep getting into that mindset, I think. Um, I also really like where you said everyone is a teacher, because what that means is we have empathy. When somebody does something bad, I think your reaction could be, I get that, I could do that, instead of, oh no, I would never do that, you know? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> that is a superiority complex. You know, if you, you know, if you, I could tell you what I, what I would not do. Somebody who convinces themselves that it's okay to, that pedophilia is okay, right? That I find disgusting, right? Because you've, you've rationalized it in your head. Now, personally, I'm not sexually attracted to young boys or something, but, um, you know, the question is, if you are, don't lie to yourself, right? Does that make sense? I mean, at the emotional level, we should be able to have as much empathy as we can. And the difference isn't 
that we are emotionally wired differently. It's how we think about those things, right? And if we say, <laughs> that's evil, I don't know why I have this attraction, but it's evil. And I got to find a way to avoid ever acting on it. I have to admit I have an evil desire. So anyway, I mean, I, I did like that, that for the most part, it's good to understand people, even when they're doing things that you don't want to think you're capable of, right? Um, and then the other thing is, I do think, you know, I liked your conclusion, these concepts lasted, and they can help or they can hinder, right? So, I mean, there are people who think that temperance means marriage between a man and a woman, no divorce, no, you know, non-binary relationships. And that's tradition, right? That's, and that's always been true until these weirdos, these, you know, radical libs come along or whatever. Um, that can hinder because we have figured out the science and we have, but I mean, they'll go so far as to say, that's why the climate is changing and life is ending is because women aren't home anymore <laughs> because we're not following tradition. And that's why God is changing the climate or something. And I, that's where you draw the line, right? Where people are not being intellectually honest. Does that make sense, guys? to be emotionally honest, but then to be really careful of how you pervert that and justify it with your, you know, your head. <laughs> okay. Anybody else want to comment on Akia's presentation? Um, so I did want to finish up with Gandhi and then I will, I will probably have to do two days in one, right? But at least I can send you the pre-class video and it will be for the class that we're supposed to have today. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, with the Gandhi, what I had the first point about the SALT ma massacre and how um, India conquered Britain because spiritually it was such an exposure of the lie that Western culture was superior, right? It was just obvious that Westerners are just as evil or more evil, right? And on the other hand, these Hindus have clearly the moral high ground. They're more civilized. There are more. And so those things are important. There are moments in history that are revelations, right? People had always assumed that the Westerners progress, the enlightenment thing, and you had to just constantly want to be Western. Um, you know, I hear from my students in Southeast Asia now and a lot of them are still aspiring to the west um but in some really really unhealthy ways so one of the huge beauty project products in in developing countries is lotion that bleaches your skin so that you have white skin or lighter skin did i tell you this before I mean, I have a, a student who's writing her whole paper on this. If you want me to send it, you know, I'll send it. Because she, this is what I try to get students to do, is think about things systematically, right? So systematic racism, systemic racism. But this systemic negative effect on the environment of these bleaching, skin bleaching lotions, right? First of all, they're negative psychologically. They're, they harm women, they harm cultures, they literally harm your skin. They get absorbed into your body. They use up uh, 
natural resources, right? The people make tons of money because people will buy this stuff. They'll pay a whole lot more and, you know, on and on. But so again, that Western superiority complex is enduring at a heavy, heavy cost to the world. Um, but anyway, so just that story of how Gandhi got over that. He was trying to be Western and he got over it. And then the world sort of got over it. And the, the next section I wanted to read you about was his philosophy, right? What's going on inside of him? Um, so I talked about how he demonstrated and how Winston Churchill despised him. Um, but now I wanted to talk about um, his idea of God. <clears throat> the word satya means truth. Um, it also denotes God. Therefore, truth is God, and God is that which is. That's very Hindu. Um, he alone is, Gandhi noted. For nothing else I see merely through the senses can or will persist. So the only thing that persists is God, which is the energy in the universe as a whole. Over the years, Gandhi tried to prove the existence of God. It's possible to reason out the existence to a limited extent. There is an orderliness in the world. There's an unalterable law governing everything and every being that exists. It's not a blind law, for no blind law can govern the conduct of human beings. That law then, which governs all life, is God. I do dimly perceive that while everything around me is ever changing, ever dying, there is underlying all that change, a living power that is changeless, that holds everything together, that creates, dissolves, and recreates. That informing power or spirit is God. In the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. Um, so he gathers that God is life, truth, and love. Um, so, uh, but suspecting the failure of this valiant rational effort, he concedes that faith transcends reason. If we could solve all the mysteries of the universe, we would be co-equal with God. Um, every drop of the ocean shares its glory, but it is not the ocean. Um, the safest course, he said, is to believe in the moral government of the world and therefore in the supremacy of the moral law, the law of truth and love. Um, God, pre, Gandhi was preoccupied with this idea of God, but he never heard a voice or saw a vision or had some particular experience. Um, Let's see, although non-Indian mystics um, occasionally attach themselves to Gandhi, he wasn't a mystic. He says, I have no special revelation. Um, really, Gandhi was just a very good example of someone on the path of action, right? He, in his action is when he felt that there was this moral force in the universe and he was in touch with that moral force. As long as he acted in a way to promote positive karma, to get rid of that negative karma and not to be violent. So that's how he felt like he was part of God in the universe. Um, let's see. Um, the power of religion, the Brahmins established themselves at the highest caste and um, okay, he's just criticizing the corruption of the Brahmins. Um, all right, here's another thing about Gandhi. Always tolerant and fair-minded, Gandhi doubted that only the sacred Hindu Vedas were the revealed word of God. Why not the Bible? Why not the Quran? He recoiled from rivalry between religions. Uh, God uses many instruments. This is, uh, and he may have used Mahatma Gandhi to Christianize 
unchristian Christianity, right? Gandhi's message to Christians is that 20th century people can be Christian, but they just have, um, have to, you know, remember what the real message of Christ is. It was his life that proved to me more than anything that Christianity is a practicable religion, even in the 20th century. So it's about a way of living. Uh, for a minute, Gandhi thought of becoming a Christian, but there were questions that found no answers. Why, he asked the Christians who were trying to convert him, did God have only one son? If he had one, why not another? In Hinduism, there have been a number of human incarnations. Why can I go to heaven and attain salvation only as a Christian? Was heaven reserved for Christians? Was God a Christian? And he said, I believe that in the other world, there are neither Hindus, Christians, nor Muslims. Um, let's see. All right, I think that's good enough. So the idea there is that he did follow the Hindu tradition closely uh, in the sense of getting in touch with the jiva and his social justice behavior was all trying to stay in touch with the jiva while you're doing your action. Um, anybody have any final comments on Gandhi? Anything I say surprise you about Gandhi or? Go ahead, Trey. Um, out of all like the good stuff he did, I just wanna know like, like we probably might not get the answer, but I just wanna know like where he got his motivation and, and thoughts to like be the man who he was. Like it's kind of crazy how he would just go out of his way and just start doing all these things and making all these moments or movements and then just, you know, go from there and to help everybody out. Well, okay, last time I was talking about that where he went to London and he tried desperately to be a good Westerner. If you want to watch that movie, if you ever have time, it's really good. You know, he dresses in the suit and he talks with a British accent and he's just, he's just Oreo cookie. I don't know if you've ever heard that expression. Um, black on the outside, white on the inside, just trying desperately to fit in. Um, but then he, he was on a, a train and he got booted out of the first class car and the people were just blatantly racist. And then he went to help his brother. He went to a legal office to get some legal help and the people were blatantly racist. And so that was the moment. Those were the things that had led to his conversion experience. He just turned around and he saw things differently. Now he could see things spiritually, right? Does that make sense, Trey? His idea of good and evil totally changed. Um, anybody else? And you can think about that yourself, Trey, if you've had an experience like that. Most people do, right? Or it's that they they realize their authority figures don't necessarily know what they're talking about. <laughs> or they aren't necessarily good people. It's hard when you have a fall from innocence of somebody you trust, right? Somebody you believe. It's hard. Um, okay. So let me again talk about, let's see what people came with. Um, the short quotes from Buddha, I talked about that in the video, that the Dalai Lama really says, if um, somebody asked him, if something new was discovered in science and um, it conflicted with Buddhism, what would you do? And he said, I'd change Buddhism. <laughs> So, I mean, this is very different from what most of you are taught. Um, all right, so the chapter on Buddhism. Uh, I talked about Buddha standing up to the authority figures. So we did Hinduism, we did 
that in theory, it's about energy and it's great. In practice, it was often sexist, uh, class-based, the caste system was horrible. Um, and just that Brahmins were corrupt. They were abusing their power. And so I talked about uh, Buddhist doctrine and Buddha and Jesus. So the, the video talks quite a bit about that. And so what I wanna do right now is just what one comment would each of you like to make about the assignment you did for today? And then we'll just pick up and I'll do, you'll have to do two pre-class videos and then um, we'll carry on. Uh, tight, but go ahead, Mary Hannah, go ahead. Um, just a quote that was kind of one of my favorites, but it says, um, this is this one, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, sorry, look. Um, perhaps the most striking thing about him was this combination of a cool head and a warm heart, a blend that shielded him from sentimentality on the one hand and indifference on the other. He was undoubtedly one of the great rationalists of all times, resembling in this respect, no one as much as um, Socrates. <laughs> yeah. Socrates. <laughs> I didn't pay this guy to write this book or anything, but uh, Michael. Um, so this is not a specific quote, but in there it talks about how his upbringing was like rather lavish and compared to some of the other people that we have discussed, like it's, it's quite a significant difference. Um, and so that was just one of the things that I, that was one of the first things that I saw um, and wanted to note. Um, yeah. Actually, do you know that um, St. Francis was the same? He was, he was born rich and he gave it all up. I don't know if you knew that, but again, that's, that happens, you know, people convert, they change, they turn around. Um, and I do think that you should realize these aren't just stories about, well, those people are special or weird. I mean, everybody has some version of these things that they go through. Um, we might, you know, I might be a lesser light but at least I get it. <laughs> okay, so that's good. That's why they tell the stories. Um, Titus, what you got? Mm, I had just a question. Like I was kind of confused about how he actually got his intelligence because it just basically talked about him suffering for a long time. And then one day he suddenly gained it. Like I know Socrates got his through asking questions. Jesus basically was born with it. Who am I miss? Aristotle obviously learned from Socrates, but I didn't see that kind of gain of knowledge through Buddha. It seems like just a spiritual awakening per se. Hey, that's was, good, Titus. That's good. It's more mysticism. He just sat under that tree, right? Right. Yeah. Well, you know, psychologically, you can imagine if you put some, you know, electrodes on his head, it would be like, there's no brain waves. And I was like, and all of a sudden, <laughs> just suddenly, I wish yeah. that can happen to me. Right. But that's why it's interesting because it is very mystical, except that as Mary Hannah said, he was also a rationalist when he came, you know, back into the world to figure out meditation techniques he really used scientific method. Okay, does that make sense? Even though he's heading for some way to blow your mind, <laughs> get you out of that rational frame of mind, he uses a lot of rational reasoning to get the system to get you to blow it up. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a good point, Titus. Um, let's see, Caitlin, I haven't called on you for a while. Um, so I really like the idea of like meditation and yoga and like I like to practice yoga and all this stuff but like two of the two quotes that really stuck out to me was um, many of us don't want to listen to the suffering inside ourselves because we're afraid we'll, we will be overwhelmed by anger despair and loneliness inside 
And then the second one was meditation can actually enable us to change a challenging situation into a situation we have true freedom. And so I really just like the ideas of meditation and mindfulness. And it was just interesting reading about his experience with those things. Okay. Again, that problematic word freedom, right? Your average American wouldn't think of freedom as being liberated from <laughs> the world. Yeah. Uh, Jason, what you got? Um, mine was kind of like on the same page as uh, Caitlin's uh, quote. Kind of reminds me of another one. Um, it's not from this. It's kind of, I'm sure maybe everybody shared this. Is, um, it goes like our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate, but that we are, uh, it's like, um, I saw how it went. Um, but that we are beyond, powerful beyond measure or beyond. Right, right. And, um, and it kind of plays into like, um, we want to, we want to be great, but in order to do that, there's, there's, I mean, you gotta, you gotta suffer a little, there's gotta be some sacrifices along the way. There's gotta be, um, you gotta, you gotta go through something. It's not, you know, it's not gonna be handed to you. It, it, it's life, you know, it's, it's bound to happen. And so I was going to talk about that, but like just Caitlin bringing that up kind of reminded me of that. Yeah. I'm just to start out with life is suffering. And then to say that religions are unrealistic, I think that is truly bizarre, right? I mean, they can be, they can be total fantasy worlds, but uh, Buddhism is really tied to reality. <laughs> Even though the punchline is mysticism, it's really tied to reality. Akaya, I've, I haven't called on you lately, sorry. So I actually uh, went off of what Michael said about how his life was lavish compared to like, all the other people we have been talking about and I just think it stuck out to me because you hear about stories how people who didn't really have it they had to work hard for it and then like the people who had the, their childhood like lavish and kind of e easy for them to like make it you know like oh yeah that, yeah but they give it up right how many people nowadays give it up I mean, it's so true that they're not happier because of their money. But I just think they do think they are happier and it's ruining our society. And they won't pay taxes and we don't have good schools. It's just ridiculous, right? People are not happier after a certain level of wealth, right? Get into the middle class, you don't have to worry. After that, it doesn't make you happy. I don't know. Um, I'm preaching the choir. Okay, Trey, you're the last one. All right. Uh, the one I got, I think we might have talked about it, but uh, did not believe in anything simply because you have heard it. Okay. And uh, that's just, that's just, I mean, it's, it's the truth. Like, just because somebody says it doesn't mean it's true. Somebody could tell you, hey, uh, so-and-so is happening. You got to go find them. But really, that person didn't even say that. So they could just be instigated on. And, you know, a lot of things, uh, my mom always says the truth isn't a lie. So a lot of things people could be telling you, but uh, somewhere there is some truth and somewhere is a lie. So that's pretty much it. Okay. Remember, Socrates said all these false rumors were really, yeah. The thing that kills Lion College is false rumors. So don't do it, guys. Okay. Um, I'll let you go. I'll send you the video for today and I'll make another one and we shall proceed. All right. Bye-bye.